Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm uh, first. I just want to say I'm really honored to be here with this community to tell you about my research and my experiences. So often we travel around the world trying to convince our um, communities within our disciplines about our research, but so little do we get to actually engage with um, the people that support us and the people that um, put us in the position to express our research. So I just want to say thank you very much to NGS, to the NGS symposium organizers, and especially to the staff. I've sent them a lot of mean emails in the past, and I just want to say sorry and thank you to <laughs> Ivy and Irene and the entire group. Okay, so um, my name is Jeffrey. I work at the uh, KONUSQ Center, and um, I'll just tell you a little bit about my background before I get into uh, my research. So I always like to start off with a quote, and the quote is this, communications technologies is concerned with the artificial texture that enables us to forget our solitude and it is thus a humanity. So the reason why I wanted to point this out is because I look to this quote to remind myself all the time that even though um, I'm not necessarily uh, a perfect fit in terms of an NGS student, I still have purpose here, there's still a reason why I'm here, and I have a passion to do something. So, like I said, my name is Jeffrey. I'm primarily an experienced designer and a new media artist. That's my background. Um, I've worked on projects such as Catwalks for Prada in Milan. Um, I've also worked on human programming for the CCTV building with the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, Graham Cool House. Um, recently, I exhibited in Singapore Design Festival as a media artist. I've also talked at some places, including TEDx in Zurich. And just recently, um, I'm ex exhibiting at the Barbican in London, which is I mean, if you're from the art world, it's more or less like a tier one form, so I'm, you know, I'm very uh, proud of this. Uh, so I just want to share that. So um, what it comes down to is that I have an unconventional background. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts, actually, in uh, Monument to Sculpture. Uh, my, my recent graduate work was in um, essentially narratology and environmental design, experience design. And I have more than five years working, actually, so I didn't go straight into my PhD after my first few degrees. I did some work in architecture and advertising and a few other creative industries, creative fields. <clears throat> so that simply says that to you that I am not an engineer, which is part of the title of NGS. I am also not a scientist. It doesn't mean that I don't think empirically. It doesn't mean that I'm not a critical person. It just means that, um, and from the previous talk, thank you, it was great. Um, that I don't necessarily have that label or the qualities for you to label me traditionally as a scientist. I still think analytically, I'm still curious, I still use method in my process, but I wouldn't necessarily call myself a scientist. So the real question is, you know, why am I here? I mean, NGS is more or less this great bastion in Singapore of engineers and scientists working together, creating really cutting-edge research. Well, essentially, um, just growing up, you know, between the digital divide, I'm, I'm 33, I'm probably a little bit older than most of the PhD students here. I've seen a lot of big changes, including a world that is increasingly becoming connected. You know, when I first um, started playing with technology, I didn't have a computer, I had a Nintendo. It wasn't online, I played by myself, maybe a friend would come over, but you know, that was pretty much the extent of my connectivity with this technology. You know, but now we have global networks that connect us. We have GPS that tells us where we are, specifically in relation to our environment, even in relation to other people. I mean, if you look at Foursquare, for instance, like that's not, just not about locations, it's about where I am in relation to my network of friends. So that's actually very abstract, if you think about it. It's, it's, a, it's a relationship uh, network, a neural network. And mobile communication technologies and the internet, you know, these things really allow us to transfer data at a dizzying rate. Um, we can download full papers, hold videos, stream movies, you know, we're transferring data very quickly these days. We have become masters of voice and video communication. Uh, you know, we can just easily turn on Skype on our phones now and talk to your mom, who is overseas possibly, and they can use Skype just as proficiently. So, you know, we've more or less reached a paradigm where we're able to use these technologies pretty seamlessly through, through our lifestyle. But what's really interesting is that we still don't have the technologies to express 
you know, deep human emotions. We don't have the technologies, or the technologies aren't necessarily good enough yet for us to communicate experiences. Um, so my research deals with looking at whole, like my overall research looks at how can we um, facilitate some of these relationships with technologies. If you look at the interactive and digital media field, you know we're currently seeing a paradigm shift. We're seeing uh, a way, a new future of technologies where you know logical and verbal communication and information sharing are not necessarily the main reason why we communicate anymore. If you look at things like uh, social networking, like Twitter, we're starting to see metrics about how we can measure feeling, how we can measure um, just general content of populations now, of, of communities. So we're, we're transforming from a non-verbal, um, non, uh, we're transferring from an information sharing and a kind of verbal and literal communication ways and experiences into the sharing of feelings and experiences. So that, that's really interesting uh, way that we're moving towards. So now specifically at the KO NUS Cute Center, we're looking at various ways that we can express and engage all our senses, not just sight and hearing, um, over the network. How can we transmit things like haptics? How can I hug someone over the internet? How can I teleport food? How can I communicate with taste? These are all questions that we ask at the laboratory. And of course we use um, we are multidisciplinary, and of course, we use various types of methods in order to scientific methods in order to reach or conduct our research or to inspire us. But there are some other methods that um, we don't necessarily document, but we still employ in order to get inspired to do what we want to do. And what I like to describe this as is called blue sky thinking. And um, you know, this was a, an idea that. I really didn't think would be accepted by any type of formal academic community, but you know, we, I still got to publish this in a, in a good conference, so at least someone out there is listening. And essentially what Blue Sky Thinking, I'll, I'll go through it, it's hard to explain, but I'll just go through it in terms of the thought process behind one of the projects that I worked on. So it goes a little something like this. We have projects that explore th living things as media. Other than purple cabbages, which we already use as a display embodiment in the Babbage Cabbage Project, are there any other forms of organisms that possess color-changing properties, and can we use them as display devices? Um, so we start to think, you know, actually, you know, certain reptiles can change color. Uh, so, so, so too can some aquatic animals, such as octopuses. So from that point, we're thinking, okay, octopuses, thinking laterally, they live in the ocean. The ocean is liquid. And then, you know, in our research group, one of us, and this is us talking essentially over three months of trying to figure out how can we use biological um, systems as interactive systems. You know, so we started thinking, you know, actually, um, instead of looking at animals, you know, where do these animals live? They live in the water. That's aquatic. Aquatic means liquid. Liquid moves fluidly. You know, so we started thinking on a lateral plane, you know, and then we started to think, hey, have you seen these? And this is essentially my contribution coming from an art background is, you know, did you see these ferrofluid sculptures by Sachima Kodama? And they're really beautiful um, ferrofluid sculptures that align to electro electromagnetic fields and produce these beautiful kinetic sculptures simply by modulating the voltage and the currency. Um, so, you know, we figured out that, you know, she uses uh, magnetism to form these. And you know, while they are you know quite um, stimulating to look at and quite inspiring, you know, from our perspective, you can't necessarily interact with the material. You can't um, use it as a display device, and you can't necessarily use it as an input or an output. Um, so we started to think, you know, maybe we can use the controllability, the linear controllability of magnetic fields, which is essentially the technical innovation of that project since magnetic fields are, are quite difficult to linearly control. And then, uh, you know, use that, uh, try to shape the magnetic field dynamically so that we can shape, therefore shape the ferrofluid to whatever we want it to make. You know, much like Magneto does to, in the X-Men, you know, he kind of like bends magnetic fields and, and manipulates his metallic world. So together with Hall effect sensing, um, we can use the same magnetic field that agitates the fluid to also sense and actuate that fluid. So this will essentially enable us to make a shape-changing three-dimensional you know, interface. And that's 
essentially, you know, how we got to the idea of pouring some liquid onto an acrylic sheet, throwing some electromagnets underneath it, and seeing what we could do with hall sensors. So, you know, to get to a point where this um, is actually usable, we would definitely have to take um, engineering methods, we'd have to conduct experiments, we'd have to measure spike height, the viscosity of the liquid, all of these things that you know you would do in a traditional experiment. But to get to that point to actually do that, we you know we we pretty much had to sit around in a bar and you know get to that point of inspiration where we've exhausted all our ideas. So what I'm trying to say blue sky thinking is it's essentially this. It is a process in which we use to develop as imaginative concepts as possible without being constrained by technical feasibility, commercial marketability, or any other practical boundary. Now, everyone who has to get grants for their labs must look at this and think, you know, how could you possibly work in such a system? But, you know, from a thought process point of view, just as a point of inspiration, you know, I would argue that it is a viable process. And even though you could argue that, okay, some of the work that you do can be easily post-rationalized, I mean, I can't, I would say yes, you can't ignore history. So even if you don't realize it at the time of you doing it, but when you realize it afterwards, it still could be just as important and just as powerful. So in the end, blue sky thinking is essentially imagination in motion, just letting your mind fly and doing whatever um, interests you. And there's no other place in the world that I've encountered barring, say, a media arts lab or another artistic pursued lab um, where you can do this. Uh, I've never seen anywhere else except for the NUS, at the KO NUS Food Center where you can do this as an academic uh, pursuit. So back to the Liquid Interface Project. Now, with the Liquid Interface Project, it's essentially a component in my PhD. Um, it's published uh, in various venues. But before I talk about that project, I would like to first talk about um, the motivation and our inspiration. So when we were thinking of this project, I also looked to, you know, how did essentially, did we, uh, did the button evolve? You know, the, the button is such a ubiquitous piece of technology, we use it in everything, but you know, what, where did it come from and where is it going? So in order to do that, we have to kind of look at the history of the way we interacted with machines. And one of these histories includes um, something called the lever. Now, up until the 1900s, we used the lever um, as the main way to interact with you know, our mechanical constructions. This, is, this included the printing press, um, this included the classical organ, doorknobs. Um, but culturally, it's expressed in um, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the, the film adaptation, where you see Dr. Frankenstein flick this huge switch in his laboratory in order to bring his monster back to life, the first, the first cyborg, you could argue. You know, so, so the lever culturally is quite significant to us, as well as, well as um, technologically. You know, later on, we were able to miniaturize this button. We were able to make it very, very small. And therefore, it didn't take so much effort for us to kind of turn that button. We could now just easily press it. And of course, the button is ubiquitous. We, ha we all have buttons in our lives. They're on your mobile phones, on your cameras, on your keyboards that you're typing out your, your papers and latex to in. Um, and culturally, um, I, I think the button more or less speaks for itself. I don't really need to go into that. Um, and currently, right now, we're in an era of surface computing. And with surface computing, we have this button again. Um, but this button is on a two-dimensional surface. But what's interesting about this button is that it can be animated. It can change its context to whatever you need it to do. And so, what's that's what's interesting about this, this button, but what it's lacking is essentially um, this feeling of tactileness. You know, if I press this button, this button will press back at my finger, so to speak. But um, in a technology like the iPad, you know, uh, you wouldn't get that. You would just feel the glass, or maybe the programmer would uh, develop a, a haptic feedback, a vibration to kind of simulate that, that pressing back to your finger, but it, it's not inherent in the actual technology or the material that they're using. So because of this, we think that the next logical iteration of the button would be would have fluid-like properties. In fact, it'll be maybe made of liquid. So um, this first prototype, we um, it wasn't actually a working prototype. But in the design world, in design thinking, we like to do something called a visual sketch. So just trying to envision and be able to communicate to other researchers in my lab, like what could this button actually possibly potentially do? 
you know, so I, I kind of created this um, this kind of uh, simulation of what would happen. Um, later on, we went to explore Hall effect sensing, and we started to think like, you know, actually touching the liquid is really messy, so it might be better to not touch the liquid. But then we would feel we would miss that feeling of wetness. Um, so how can we replace that with another physical um, interaction? So what we did uh, was essentially use um, a magnet. Uh, a neodymium magnet on your fingertip that is light polarity with the electromagnet that's firing underneath the surface, and paired that with the Hall effect sensor so that when you press down, when you when you move your hands towards the liquid, um, you can physically feel um, the repulsing of the magnet, and then the Hall effect sensor will actuate the liquid so you can manipulate the surface this way. So going down to the liquid, pulling up shapes, for instance, and being able to press those shapes in order to interact with the machine. And, you know, our first application, of course, really rudimentary, um, was the xylophone. Um, so you could feel the physical response on the, uh, the paddle, um, but you would also get a visual and audio feedback, just to show that, you know, what, what if we use different mod modalities for this. Now, um, this was shown at a, at a demo in a conference, and, and we got a lot of good feedback. Um, yeah, that's essentially, that's essentially it right now. Uh, so, with this project, I mean, I like to think very, very far ahead, and of course we're not even there, we're not there yet at all. I mean, we're looking at possibly how can we make liquid core magnets in order to to modulate the shape of the magnetic field better, but you know, a lot of my inspiration comes from scenes like this, where you know you have the Terminator who, who changes shape in the abyss. In the abyss, you have essentially this computer interface that um, changes in three-dimensional space and is very fluid. And you know, this is what I envision. Um, hopefully, our world will get to when we think about interacting with machines. So um, I said a mouthful and I, I went across the board. I'm, I'm really thankful that you stayed to listen and thank you so much for your time. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks. because when you're a pilot, I, I would guess that you would need very analytical information in order to perform your job properly. So maybe, I don't know if, this, if a system like that, if, if it could respond fast enough and give you the right plain information, then possibly yes. I see it more as a creative tool. So, I mean, imagine if you're an architect and you wanted to rapidly simulate what a building would look, look like. Now we use a... Um, a rapid uh, prototyper, uh, 3D printing machine, which will print out maybe a building in a few hours. But I can imagine, you know, using a system like that, where you'd essentially just turn it on, and out of liquid, it would just be formed. Yeah, yeah for instance, yeah, that, yeah, that would, that, that's a nice uh, ima uh, imagination of it, definitely. Yeah. Please. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. When I think of the track track. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not going to use a mouse anymore. I can't use a mouse as well. Uh, and it's actually very tactile because you, you know, you're stroking something which has, you know, a track or four track texture or track on my head. But to go to your last bit, you have a, a return to the feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, to look further forward, you could have more dodges there. If that plugs into your own um, nervous system, then you actually become you become quite seamless with the machine, mm. and then yeah, it becomes again yeah, the little fact fiction. You go into the spaceship, you put your hand down, and you're connected to the the, the onboard computer, and that's it. So I mean, there are quite a lot of people who are working on that sort of aspect of man machine interface. So what are your yeah. thoughts about that? Well, I think we're. I mean, if. If you've been reading the blogs about, like, uh, there's a consumer electronics show which just happened a few days ago, actually. And at, at the show, you know, there are quite a few um, demos of brain interfaces. So essentially, these kind of take home, very finished product, you could take it home, you put it on your, on your head, and you could essentially interact with the computer right away. And that's a commercial product. So I think, um, I think 
not just in the research field, but I think also within the commercial field is, you know, uh, beginning to have a lot of interest about how can we interact with these machines in different ways. I mean, if you look at the Nintendo Wii versus the Xbox and the PlayStation 3. So let me just take this as an example. You know, um, there was a lot of user study and a lot of survey um, that asked the next, that the, the gaming industry, uh, the gaming community, what is the next generation of computers? What do you want? And most people said, like, we want better virtuality, better graphics, better sound, bigger, bigger and better explosions. You know, but Nintendo didn't have the capability to do that. So what they did is that they decided, you know what, we're going to introduce a new way of interaction. We'll use the same old hardware, but we're going to give you a remote and we're going to put an accelerometer in that and give you a new way to interact. And that opened up a whole new world of gaming. And now you have the Xbox, for instance, you have casual games. People who never played games now play games on their iPhones. Maybe attributed to only because they can touch and interact with the machine in a different way than using the controller. You know, so I, I find that to be very exciting and I think um, we're definitely you know, already in that ebb of where, where we're interacting with machines in a totally different way, and that's very exciting to me. Anyone else? Okay. Well, thank you so much again for your time. Thanks, Jeffy, for that highly interesting talk. Hopefully I'm done with my research work before you all terminate a T-1000 minutes. Take over the world. Thank you.